Where are you really from? To find out, let's embark on a ride through the annals of history. Together, we're boarding a train that will whisk us through the landscapes of the past. But this isn't just any journey. It's a genetic voyage through your lineage. Perhaps you are American, born and raised. One step back and both of your parents also were born and grew up in the States. Same city as each other, childhood sweethearts. Their parents, your grandparents, also lived their life in the same state, moving from the countryside to the city for work. They met, fell in love, and found their new homes. So far, so predictable. But their parents were different. Some came from nearby towns, but your grandmother's family had roots much further away. A mere three stops back in time, we alight at a bustling market town in the heart of Hungary. Here we see your great-grandparents strolling amongst the stalls and bartering for goods, while the cobblestones beneath their feet echo with the clip-clop of horse-drawn carriages. We could stay here for a long time, but the train is departing once again. As the wheels turn, taking us further back in time, we find ourselves in the 11th century. We see that, before your ancestors settled in Central Europe, they roamed the expanses of the Eurasian steppe. Mongol invasions swept through Hungary in the 13th century, conquering fiefs and taking wives, and your lineage was born out of these battles. The railroad track stretches even further, and we see your ancestors retracing ancient migratory routes carved out during bygone ice ages. We see them cross great swathes of tundra in today's northern Russia, small family groups huddled together in the bitter snow. But then, the train accelerates again, shuddering this time as we fly through tens of thousands of generations. The carriage begins to be warmed by the birthplace of all humanity. Africa. Through the blur of the sun, rising and setting over great savannas, you see beings much less familiar than those who came before. Human-like, but not quite human. A horn sounds from the head of the train, and unthinkably, we're speeding even faster. The carriage wobbles and sways in its tracks. Your ancestors beyond the window are less and less human with every passing moment. Suddenly, the train lurches, rolling from the track and crashing into the darkness. Gingerly, you open your eyes to see an endless forest through the shattered glass of the carriage window. There are creatures moving in the gloom of the trees. You realize these strange beings are a continuation of our genetic voyage. Your uncountably distant great-grandparents swinging through the canopy more than 10 million years ago. These apes mark a great transition. They are changing, soon to become the first creatures we would classify as human-like. Their hominin descendants will be walking and crafting tools on the plains of Africa. But this forest, this integral juncture in the journey of our ancestors from animal to human-like, where is it? Is it in Africa or somewhere else? Where did humanity's story truly begin? Not all of us know our full story. It could have twists and turns, migrations and branches that we never even knew about. And that's why MyHeritage is such a fun service to sign up for. How sponsor today. MyHeritage makes it fun and easy to build your family tree and discover your origins. And you might also find new relatives. A large amount of my family came from Ireland, and so there are some fascinating stories going back over the tumultuous 20th century. And as soon as I typed in my father and mother's name and birth dates into their amazing smart match system, it connected my family tree with someone in Australia, which revealed waves of relatives I never even knew about. So within five seconds of logging on, my family tree already had 72 people. And that was just on my mother's side. Here's an image of my great-great-grandfather I'd never seen before. And this is because MyHeritage is a worldwide leading family history service. It gives you the opportunity to travel back in time along your bloodline, with more than 19 billion records available. As a bonus, you can even colorize old photos and bring your family history back to life. And even animate them. 
So, sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. And if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get a 50% discount. Thanks to MyHeritage for supporting educational content on YouTube. A biting wind sweeps across the endless expanse of Beringia. It is a vast, cold landscape bridging two worlds, Siberia on one side and the Americas on the other. It stretches out before a weary but determined band of travelers, their ragged breaths and heavy footsteps punctuating the near silence of this unknown territory. Their leader looks out across the frosty plains, his dark eyes shining with unflinching purpose. He knows that this journey is not just for him, nor for the small band he leads, but for the generations that their survival will ensure. With each step they take, they are forging a path into history and creating a future for their descendants. Clothed in specially tailored furs and hides, with tools nabbed from stone and ivory, they advance their path lit by the pale, spectral glow of Aurora Borealis above their heads. Days turn into weeks, and weeks bleed into months. They follow the migration of the caribou, their presence a solid and comforting reminder that life carries on in this new world. After countless risings of the sun, the humans emerge into a vast and verdant expanse of land. One that teems with all manner of flora and fauna and is rich with the promise of new opportunities. Mammoth, horses and larger herds of bison than they've ever seen. There are predators here too, and the travelers must be ever vigilant to avoid the teeth and claws of a saber-toothed cat or a pack of dire wolves. This pioneering band of humans will carve out a place for themselves in this new world, and centuries later, history will come to know them as some of the first Americans. Their dauntless passage into the unknown will become etched in the DNA of their descendants and into the Earth itself. Humans and animals are not static entities bound to a single location or a way of life. Survival often lies in movement, whether it's the seasonal migrations of herds across the plains or the nomadic lifestyles of human tribes. This inherent restlessness is not just a response to the immediate challenges of finding food, water, or shelter. It's a complex interplay of social, environmental, and sometimes even spiritual factors that drive individuals and communities to venture beyond the familiar. It shapes not only the course of individual lives, but also the contours of ecosystems and the trajectory of species. And so, to an archaeologist, the Earth is more than just dirt and stone. It is a vast library of information, a library that, for those who know where and how to look, tells tales of great journeys long past, the crisscrossing migrations of our ancient ancestors across the globe. But what happens when archaeology can't help us untangle our history? What if we go further back, much further, epochs that predate the archaeological record by millions of years? How can science help us reconstruct migrations from thousands of millennia ago, before Homo sapiens or even the Homo genus came into existence? It isn't easy. Imagine trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle when you're not even sure what the final picture is supposed to look like, or if you have all the correct pieces. Consider the primates of South America. Today, the continent bustles with a riot of species, from the pocket-sized pygmy marmosets scampering through the trees like squirrels, to the aptly named howler monkeys who fill the air with their unmistakable calls. While it's certainly a vibrant tapestry of life and diversity, it's also one that is woven around a big, gaping mystery. How did they get there? They seem to have been there for nearly 35 million years, well before North America was close enough to South America for them to travel across. But amidst the dense foliage of the Peruvian Amazon, under many layers of sediment, they are a crucial piece of evidence. 
Buried during the Eocene around 34 million years ago were the fossilized teeth of some of the earliest primates to live in South America. And in an odd twist, these teeth greatly resembled those of African primates from the same time period. These creatures must have evolved in Africa, so how did they end up in the heart of South America so many millions of years ago? To answer questions on animal migrations like this, scientists have to become detectives, piecing together clues from several different sources. They can look at ancient ocean currents and continental drift to understand possible migration routes. They also have to consider the diets of these early primates to understand the ecological niches they might have filled. On top of this, genetic studies can offer insights into how these early South American primates were related to their African counterparts. And climate models can reveal the kinds of environmental conditions these primates would have encountered. Considered together, these strands of evidence hint at a multi-layered mystery and a grand voyage taken by these primates across the Atlantic Ocean, which, during the Eocene, wasn't quite as enormous as we know it today. With the Atlantic slightly narrower and populated by now sunken islands, these primates may have embarked on an unexpected odyssey, on rafts made of natural vegetation, taking them from their African heartland to a new home in the rainforests of South America. Fascinatingly, this is far from the only time such a voyage has been made. As improbable as they might seem, such migrations can even happen today. On the 11th of March 2011, the Tohoku earthquake decimated large swathes of the Japanese coastline. Yet as the tsunamis receded, they took with them unintended cargo. All kinds of marine species, from fish to mollusks and sea anemones to worms. Thrust into the vast expanse of the Pacific on a myriad of debris, these unwitting ocean voyagers were carried thousands of miles away. In time, the shores of North America and the Hawaiian Islands would become their unexpected landing sites. And the journey of our own evolution is no less fascinating. As you might expect, our story begins in Africa. But as you might not expect, it started there more than 35 million years ago. It was in the vast landscapes of the continent, amidst the hot, sun-baked sands and lush, vibrant forests, that a group of fascinatingly monkey-like animals made their home during the mid-Eocene. These were the early stem catarines, and it was their destiny to become the ancestors of all humans, apes and African monkeys. As continents drifted and climates changed, they learned to survive and thrive in a range of environments, from the forest canopy to the savannah and their genes carried the seeds of this adaptability, as well as the burgeoning intelligence that would one day give rise to everything from the intricate social structures of baboons, to the problem-solving abilities of chimpanzees, and the complex cultures of humans. This is Egyptopithecus, one of the earliest known stem catarines. It lived during the latter part of the Eocene, around 30 million years ago, and despite its name, meaning Egyptian monkey, it wasn't really a monkey at all. Egyptopithecus was more like a stepping stone in primate evolution, a crucial link between the early primates, a fork in the road that would eventually lead to the kinds of monkey and ape species we see today. Although it wasn't particularly closely related to either modern monkeys or apes, Egyptopithecus is sometimes referred to as the dawn ape. Though it had a relatively small brain in proportion to its body, its eyes were front-facing, a clue that it was on the evolutionary fast track. Its large molar teeth and sturdy build hint that it was a fruit lover, feasting on the variety that ancient African forests had to offer. We can imagine it nimbly navigating through the treetops, its long fingers expertly gripping branches, while its sharp eyes keep a lookout for juicy fruit, or maybe even a tasty insect. But Egyptopithecus wasn't the first ape. So what was, and where, did it come from? The answer to that question isn't a simple one. However, if we turn to a later chapter in our evolutionary family album, we find a creature known as Proconsul, which might just offer some clues. 
Roaming the planet around 23 to 17 million years ago, with a mix of primitive traits reminiscent of earlier primates and more advanced features that seem to foreshadow what was to come, Proconsul is considered by many to be one of the earliest definitive members of the ape lineage. But what makes Proconsul particularly interesting in the context of ancient migrations is its location. Its fossils have been found primarily in East Africa, suggesting that is where the ape lineage had its true origins. Not only that, but its location, many thousands of miles from where its potential ancestor Egyptopithecus was found, suggests that early apes were beginning to diversify and expand into different locations and different ecological niches, potentially setting the stage for the grand migrations that would later populate other continents. But what environmental cues prompted such migrations? How did these early explorers adapt to new landscapes? And what challenges did they face? Primates like Proconsul, adapted to diverse African ecosystems, eventually gave rise to more specialized forms. And as environmental conditions changed, perhaps due to shifts in climate, vegetation, or even geological events like the formation of the Mediterranean Sea, these early apes might have found themselves pushed or pulled into new habitats. Over time, this could have led to the emergence of species better adapted to new conditions, like Dryopithecus. And if there is any doubt about whether Proconsul was a true ape or not, there is none of that about Dryopithecus. Representing a significant leap in our evolutionary timeline, they lived around 12.5 to 9.5 million years ago. What's particularly fascinating about Dryopithecus is its more advanced adaptations for arboreal life, including features that suggest it was capable of brachiation or swinging through trees, much like modern apes. This indicates a level of specialization and adaptability that would have been crucial for survival in new and varied environments. Additionally, Dryopithecus also had a more advanced dental structure compared to earlier primates like Proconsul. Its teeth were adapted for a varied diet that likely included a mix of fruits and leaves, much like the menu options for today's apes. But they were not the only things that stood out about Dryopithecus, this promising candidate for one of the earliest links in the human chain. For Dryopithecus lived in Europe. Around the year 500, Western Europe was plunged into darkness. The once mighty Roman Empire had fallen, leaving its former territories to fend for themselves, and people were in desperate need of guidance. Villages lay isolated from one another as forests were allowed to take over, roads that once connected cities were buried beneath ivy and moss, and libraries were either abandoned or destroyed. And yet, while Europe crumbled, other parts of the world flourished. The House of Wisdom in Baghdad shone like a beacon of knowledge, and the Tang and Song dynasties of China bore witness to inventions that would change the world. From gunpowder to the first mechanical clocks, China was a hub of innovation, while the Mayan cities of Tikal and Palenque were centers of culture and commerce. So even though Europe may have been draped in darkness, the flame of knowledge and discovery blazed brightly in other parts of the world. By simply widening your viewpoint, it quickly becomes apparent that the so-called Dark Ages weren't so dark after all. But is this also the case with our more distant origins? Have we been focusing for too long on the wrong place? For much of the 20th century, paleoanthropological research was heavily concentrated in Africa. Groundbreaking discoveries, such as the fossils of the Tongue Child and Lucy, painted a convincing picture of Africa as the birthplace of humankind. However, the wealth of ancient ape fossils, such as Dryopithecus in Eurasia, muddied things a little. Theories arose suggesting that the origins of our ape ancestors may actually have been in Europe, that we may have made some of the journey to being human-like outside of Africa. Indeed, Dryopithecus has been found in places like France, Spain, and Hungary, 
demonstrating that by about 10 million years ago, apes had not only diversified, but had also begun to venture out of Africa. And so could Dryopithecus, a European ape, have been the direct ancestor to modern apes and humans? While it's tempting to think so, given its advanced features, the current scientific consensus is more cautious. Dryopithecus is considered to be more of a cousin than a grandparent in our evolutionary family tree. It's one of several Miocene apes that show a mix of primitive and advanced features, and it likely shares a common ancestor with the lineages that led to modern apes and humans. However, the fossil record between the time of Dryopithecus and the emergence of more direct human ancestors like Australopithecus is still incomplete, leaving room for ongoing research and debate. But there was another parallel between the Dark Ages in Europe and the complex story of our ape ancestry that led some scientists to believe that these key moments of our evolution may have taken place outside of Africa. Researchers noted a conspicuous lack of late Miocene ape fossils unearthed on the African continent. An African ape, Dark Ages. This dearth of fossils from between 14 and 7 million years ago on the African continent became known as the African Ape Gap. In the millions of years prior to this gap, archaeologists had not only found species like Proconsul, but a whole range of primates like Dendropithecus, Ranguapithecus, Morotopithecus, and many more. Then, on the other side of the gap, in the late Miocene, the African fossil record suddenly became richer again. Here we find species like Sahelanthropus chidensis and Ororentugenensis, early members of the human genus. But while apes in Africa seem to take an extended hiatus during this ape gap, the fossil record in Eurasia paints a very different picture. Europe and Asia were filled to the brim with ape species during the Miocene and Pliocene epochs, which seems strange when we consider how few species remain today. Of the three living non-human great ape genera, only one exists outside of Africa, the orangutans. And yet the evolutionary history of great apes in the Eurasian Miocene is rich and colourful. Twelve million years ago, India and Pakistan were home to Sivapithecus, an ape that resembled both modern chimpanzees and orangutans, although it's not clear which it was more closely related to. Eleven million years ago, Hispanopithecus swung through the forests of the Iberian Peninsula, and in Greece, around nine million years ago, you could have come face to face with Oranopithecus, an ape that is considered by some to have been a possible relative to modern great apes and humans. And so this gap in the African fossil record raised intriguing questions about our evolution and the dynamics of paleontological discovery. Why was there a gap? Was there genuine absence? or a result of other biases in research or exploration. Biases can appear in the fossil record in a multitude of ways. First of all, of course, there is the human element. 97% of fossil data is produced by researchers from high or upper middle income countries, primarily located in the global north. This can skew the fossil record simply by a disproportionately small percentage of Africa being excavated, in comparison to Eurasia, for practicality reasons alone. As if these human-led biases weren't enough, the Earth itself may have contributed to the apparent 7 million year absence of our ancestors in Africa. Some scientists have argued that environmental conditions in Africa during the late Miocene might not have favoured the preservation of fossils, and that is why there appears to be such a big gap in the ape fossil record. One of the ecosystems that expanded during the late Miocene was the tropical rainforest. All these environments are rich in biodiversity, they are notoriously poor in preserving fossils. The acidic soils and high levels of microbial activity rapidly decompose organic material, leaving little to fossilize. The late Miocene was also a period of significant climate change, including shifts in sea levels and the drying up of inland seas and lakes. These fluctuations could have led to sedimentary environments that were not stable enough for long-term fossil preservation. And so, if these environmental and ecological factors did indeed make the late Miocene a challenging period for fossil preservation, then it's entirely possible that a variety of ape species lived during this time but were simply not fossilized, and their remains therefore lost to the ravages of time. 
However, in more recent years, new fossils have been found. Fossils that have begun to do away entirely with the idea of an African ape gap. Fossils of Miocene apes edging ever closer to creatures we would classify as human-like, unearthed thousands of miles from the Eurasia of Dryopithecus and Oranopithecus. The course of human history was about to migrate. In a broad-leaved forest nine and a half million years ago lived a creature caught between the worlds of hominins and other apes. It was large, tipping the scales at 60 kilograms and had features reminiscent of the much older proconsul, as well as characteristics that wouldn't show up in apes for millions of years afterwards. In fact, this creature's fossilized jawbone had some striking resemblances to those of today's African apes. It's almost like looking at a family photo and spotting a distant relative you've never met. Because of its size, you can't help but think of modern gorillas, and this has led the scientific community to ponder an intriguing question. Could this creature be an ancient forebear not just of gorillas, but also of chimps, bonobos, and even humans? But what was it? Back in September 1982, the team who discovered a fossilized jawbone in the Samburu district of Kenya were asking themselves exactly the same question. This obviously wasn't just any fossil. It was clear early on that it could be a game changer. This was Samburupithecus kiptalami, an enigmatic primate that has been puzzling scientists ever since. Up until this point, a strong case could have been made that the crucial stages of ape evolution, just before the divergence of apes and hominins, had mostly played out in the lush forests of Europe. Discoveries of genera like Dryopithecus, as well as others such as Oreopithecus and Graecopithecus, had tipped the scale. But Samburupithecus, living in what is now Kenya, turned that narrative upside down. Its discovery was like finding a missing puzzle piece, once again placing Africa back in the spotlight. And indeed, since the discovery of Samburupithecus in the 1980s, the Miocene African Ape Club has welcomed several more members, taking the now archaic African ape gap and filling it with life. To quote astronomer Carl Sagan, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and people were starting to realize that the fossils of African apes were out there all along. 2007 brought another discovery. Deep within the arid plains of Kenya's Nakali region, another fossilized jawbone was recovered from beneath layers of sediment. But this time, it belonged to a species known as Nakalipithecus nakayami. Dated to almost 10 million years ago, Nakalipithecus was another ape that lived right in the middle of the so-called African ape gap, providing yet more evidence against the gap. Not only that, but Nakalipithecus, like Samburupithecus, bore many similarities to modern African apes, hinting at the possibility of a close evolutionary relationship. With thick dental enamel and robust molars and premolars much like gorillas, it is likely that Nakalipithecus had a diet consisting of hard, abrasive foods, perhaps including nuts, seeds, or even certain types of fruit. These robust teeth would have been essential for breaking down tougher vegetation and food sources, hinting at an environment where such food items were key dietary components. Facially, Nakalipithecus likely resembled other African great apes, with a strong jaw reflecting its diet. So if we think back to Dryopithecus, our ancient ape cousin, how did primates like Samburupithecus and Nakalipithecus, which would have shared a common ancestor with Dryopithecus, end up in Africa? Answering that question forces us to delve into the complexities of ancient migrations, environmental changes, and the twists and turns of evolution. First of all, it's important to note that the story of primate evolution does not unfold in a straight line. It's more like a branching tree, with various lineages exploring different evolutionary and geographical avenues. While Dryopithecus was making itself at home in the forests of Europe, other primate lineages like Samburupithecus and Nakalopithecus were evolving and diversifying in Africa. The two continents were part of a larger ecosystem connected by land bridges and changing environmental conditions, allowing for the possibility of back-and-forth migrations. 
prior to the Miocene, land migration between Africa and Eurasia would not have been possible, with the Tethys Seaway totally separating the continents. As the seaway closed, the Gompatherium land bridge arose, enabling these migrations. Indeed, one theory suggests that the ancestors of modern apes and humans might have originated in Africa, migrated to Europe and Asia, and then returned to Africa. This out-of-Africa, into-Africa hypothesis suggests that some primates, perhaps even relatives of Dryopithecus, made their way back to Africa, and once there, they continued to evolve into the lineages that would eventually give rise to modern apes and humans. But as with any migration, we have to assume that there must have been some reason for its occurrence, perhaps a dramatic shift in the environmental conditions of the time. And as it turns out, there was. At Yale University in 2014, Professor Yi Ge Chung helmed a pivotal exploration into the thermal annals of the tropical Pacific Ocean, tracing back an impressive 12 million years. The team, employing isotropic analysis from marine microorganisms, reconstructed a meticulous temperature timeline. The tropical Pacific Ocean serves as a cornerstone in steering the world's climate patterns. During the pivotal epochs of the Miocene and early Pliocene, about 15 to 5 million years ago, a period integral to ape evolution, this study showed pronounced temperature changes. And these were not just minor fluctuations. These oscillations likely led to alternating periods of warming and cooling, affecting ocean currents, atmospheric circulation, and consequently, events on land. A key revelation from this study was the identification of persistent El Nino-like conditions in the late Miocene. Today, El Nino events come with a range of global climate impacts, including more rainfall in some regions and droughts in others. However, in the late Miocene, around 10 to 5 million years ago, persistent El Nino-like conditions would have meant a more consistently warm and wet climate, potentially leading to the expansion of tropical forests. But following this, as the climate cooled and became drier, these once expansive forests began to fragment, being replaced by grasslands. Could it have been this climatic transition that spurred our potentially European forebears to seek the temperate embrace of African landscapes once again? Changes in food availability, habitat types, and competition among species would have created both challenges and opportunities for survival and migration. The change in climates would have opened up new ecological niches, potentially driving these apes to venture into new territories, including the African continent, in search of greener pastures. And so, though there have been questions over our whereabouts in these key moments in our distant history, there is no doubt where modern humanity evolved. Six to seven million years ago, the earliest human-like hominins. A little under three million years ago, the rise of the Homo genus. And around 300,000 years ago, the first anatomically modern humans. All of these milestones occurred in humanity's homeland, Africa. Tracing our lineage further back reveals primate migrations across land and sea. Asia to Africa, Africa to Europe, Europe to Africa and the rise of the human family saw no end to these journeys. We know of several huge migrations of archaic humans from Africa to Eurasia. Homo erectus expeditions around 2 million years ago reached as far as northeastern China. Homo antecessor crossed from Africa to Europe 600,000 years later, followed in another 600,000 years by Homo heidelbergensis, commonly regarded as the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Their Neanderthal descendants flourished across Europe and Western Asia until an invasion occurred by yet another species migrating out of Africa. Us. Wave after wave of Homo sapiens dispersed from Africa to Eurasia. The earliest wave may have been as long as 270,000 years ago. DNA evidence suggests that all non-Africans alive today descend from a wave or waves of migration out of Africa between 50 and 80,000 years ago. Our roots are clearly not confined to our immediate ancestry or the countries we identify with. Instead, they stretch back millions of years, crisscrossing the globe from one continent to another 
and then back again. It's a story of ceaseless movement, without which we would not be here. And so the more we learn about our genetic past, the more complex the rail network becomes. For while we've made remarkable strides in evolutionary science, gaps in our understanding persist. The same problems and biases that plagued archaeologists trying to fill the African ape gap have plagued the study of our species for as long as we have been digging. And these challenges have left our evolutionary tree with several gaping holes. A small aircraft streaks across the sky. Followed closely by an enemy fighter, it leaves trails of smoke in its wake. It's been hit, and it's going down fast. Another volley of enemy fire, and the aircraft's wings are ablaze. Its engines sputter out. Its fate is sealed. It's 1942, and World War II has transformed the skies into a battlefield. Imagine you've been tasked with solving a problem that could mean life or death for the brave men fighting for your country. Bomber planes keep returning from missions riddled with bullet holes, and you need to find out why some parts of the planes appear to be more vulnerable than others. What would you do when faced with such a puzzle? To the military experts of the time, the answer seemed obvious. Reinforce the areas taking the most hits. This would ensure that the planes were stronger and fewer fighting men would be lost, wouldn't it? But you see through the illusion the planes are creating. You realize that the data you've been given are misleading. The planes that return are the survivors. The one that could withstand enemy fire and make it back to base in more or less one piece. It's the planes that haven't returned that hold all the answers. What if the areas without damage on the returning bombers are untouched? Not because they are less vulnerable, but because planes hit in those places never make it back at all. For mathematician Abraham Wald, this was a crucial revelation. In the early 1940s, he used statistical analysis and probability theories to expose the survivorship bias that plagued military planning. And, in a counterintuitive stroke of brilliance, he suggested reinforcing the undamaged areas of the bombers instead. Much like Wald's bombers, the hominin fossil record presents us with a skewed sample. Fossils survive through a narrow set of circumstances, rapid burial, specific soil chemistry, and a lack of destructive natural forces. What we see in museum displays and scientific papers are the returning bombers. Those remains fortuitous enough to be fossilized and eventually discovered. It tempts us to make sweeping conclusions about human evolution based on incomplete data, from attributing characteristics to entire species based on a single piece of bone, to understanding the biodiversity of our ancestral lineage. And so where are our missing planes, the hominins and primates that didn't make it into the fossil record? Just as Wald had to account for the bombers that never returned, paleoanthropologists must grapple with ghost lineages and big gaps in the fossil record. These gaps can mislead us about everything, from ancient migration patterns to the environmental pressures that shaped us. And this isn't just an isolated problem. Our perception of the past is filled with similar gaps, and those gaps don't just relate to what we found or haven't found. Take the Cambrian Explosion. This was a period over half a billion years ago when there was a rapid diversification of life forms. An explosion of multicellularity that laid the groundwork for much of the complexity of life we see around the globe today. But our understanding of this era is also highly biased. Back in the Cambrian period, many life forms were soft-bodied, which meant they didn't fossilize well. Because of that, the fossil record is potentially skewed towards hard-bodied organisms, leaving us with an incomplete picture of the biodiversity of that time. Just as our view of ape evolution is constrained by biases, our view of the Cambrian period is constrained by the limitations of the fossil record. Traveling forward nearly half a billion years, the Middle Pleistocene, spanning roughly from 125,000 to 780,000 years ago, may have come much later in time than the Cambrian Explosion or African Ape Gap, but in many ways, it tells a similar story. 
By this time period, times have truly moved on from Dryopithecus and Samburopithecus. Those early apes, equipped with long arms and grasping hands, were adept tree dwellers. Yet, as the epochs shifted to the Middle Pleistocene nearly 10 million years later, landscapes have transformed. Forests, grasslands and rivers dominate, and the human species of this era journey across these terrains in a totally different way. Bipedalism has emerged as a defining trait, and this evolution has freed the hands, enabling more intricate interactions with the environment. During this era, our ancestors were on the cusp of transformative changes. Changes that brought them ever closer to what we would consider to be well and truly human. Fashioning intricate hand axes and cleavers, and reshaping the very fabric of their social lives. Perhaps even laying the groundwork for complex cultures and diving into the depths of symbolic thought. And physically, their brains were expanding, while their bones started showing adaptations fit for running marathons. And perhaps most importantly, we had spread. This period saw many human species flourishing all across the globe. Homo erectus, the first human lineage we can be certain traversed out of Africa, was still surviving in Asia. Homo heidelbergensis thrived across Africa, Europe and possibly Asia too. Homo antecessor in Spain, Homo naledi in South Africa, and hobbit-like Homo floresiensis have been found in Indonesia. Neanderthals spread across Europe and Western Asia, with the newly identified Denisovans inhabiting Eastern Asia. And our own species, Homo sapiens, was born in Africa before spreading across the globe. Of course, it's also likely that several more species existed during this Middle Pleistocene period. We just haven't yet discovered them. For despite our knowledge of so many different species, like the African ape gap, the Middle Pleistocene is akin to a book with half its pages missing. Large gaps in our knowledge have led some to call this period the Muddle in the Middle. And during this Muddle, there were several different human species living on the Earth. But thanks to the patchiness of the fossil record, especially in Africa and Asia, this period is poorly understood. Dive into the Muddle in the Middle, and you'll encounter beings that represent a curious blend of old and new. Some of them look familiar. Almost like if you dressed them in modern clothing, you'd barely take notice if they passed you on the street, while others test the limits of our imagination. Neanderthals, for example, were similar to us in many ways, but species like Homo heidelbergensis were quite different. Found across Europe and Africa, heidelbergensis fossils exhibit a mix of archaic and modern traits. Their robust brow ridges and large faces are reminiscent of early hominins. Yet their brain size and some aspects of their postcranial anatomy suggest they were on the path leading to modern humans. Similarly, the enigmatic Homo antecessor, known from sites in Spain, presents a mosaic of features, some of which are surprisingly modern, while others seem more primitive. And then there is the geographical spread of the fossils. The Middle Pleistocene saw hominins inhabiting vast stretches of the Old World. From the chilly forests of Europe to the tropical savannas of Africa, this widespread distribution led to regional variations, making it even harder to piece together a coherent evolutionary narrative. As if the Middle Pleistocene wasn't puzzling enough, the discovery of a whole new species in 2013 threw the paleoanthropological community into uproar. Deep within the claustrophobic confines of the Rising Star cave system in South Africa, a team of archaeologists recovered the remains of several diminutive hominins dating from 335,000 to 236,000 years ago. This was during the Middle Pleistocene, but the creatures from Rising Star had very little in common with the other hominins known from that era. South African paleoanthropologist Lee Berger, who led the team which made the discovery, named the new species Homo naledi. But with a brain size closer to that of its more ancient relatives, and a body structure suggesting bipedalism and perhaps even tool use, Naledi defied easy categorization. Yet, as the filling of the African ape gap has shown, our understanding of primate evolution is far from complete, and is subject to revision. Whether the Miocene or the Pleistocene, Africa or Eurasia, there is still so much that we don't know about who we are 
and where we came from. But in many ways, that is the allure of it. The narrative of human evolution, filled with its gaps and shadows, is a book that's still being written. You've been watching the entire history of humankind. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.